Hold on, bring it back. Welcome to the Endurance Town USA podcast, a state of mind destination where endurance athletes of all levels connect together. This episode of our Faces Behind the Races mini series is brought to you by Race Roster, a premier North American event registration partner for race directors everywhere. I'm Travis Ford, producer and man behind the curtain here at the Endurance Town USA podcast. Today, our host and Race Slow founder, Samantha Pruitt, meet up with the incredible ultra marathon running icon, Chrissy Mail. Chrissy's been touring across the nation in a role as a running ambassador for Patagonia, and we were fortunate enough to meet up with her right here in our home base of San Luis Obispo, California. So not only is Chrissy a running ambassador for Patagonia, as I mentioned, but she's also a very well-known runner in the ultramarathon world. But you may also know her as an author for her wildly popular book, Running Your First Ultra. In her 17 years as an ultra runner, she's been featured in films by Patagonia and National Geographic, plus she's written for publications worldwide, including the New York Times and Outside Magazine. We've listed Chrissy's full bio in the show notes, and I definitely recommend checking it out. Okay, now I've officially taken up enough of your time. I'll let Sam take it from here. Hey, Chrissy. Welcome to San Luis Obispo. Thank you. Great Welcome to have back. You here. Welcome back. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I would like to interview you today and find out a little bit more about you as a, as a human, okay. not just as an athlete and a race director, but we know you in all those ways. And I wanted to find out from you a little bit of your backstory. So can you tell us where you grew up and what your family dynamic looked like? Right on. Get way back in there. Yeah, I, let's go. So I grew up in Bow, Washington. I was actually born in Pasadena. And it was really cool to get to go back there on this film trip just a couple days ago because I haven't been back in my adult life. And it was probably more for my parents than myself. We moved away when I was a year old. Mm -hmm. So Washington is home. I find myself saying I'm a Washington girl or a Pacific Northwest girl. And after moving around moved 11 times in 11 years, including wow. Boulder, Colorado and Bend, Oregon, and a lot are throughout the state of Washington, mostly on the West side. I, I want to call Washington home. I've cool. kind of proved to myself through all my travels that that is, that's where my heart resonates. I love seeing the world and getting out and filling my passport. But when it's time to go home, it's, it's to the big trees in the Northwest. Well, why did your parents move you at one to Washington? What was the calling there for them? They have all sorts of different reasons of why it was time to get out of California. And I think a lot of them resonate with that whole era of people moving out of California and moving north and getting out of the expense that was building in the California. Like they were able to buy a home where they were affordable, affordable home mm -hmm. where and they still live in it 39 years later. Oh, that's cool. They still live in Bo. They still live in both. Well, in the, the house, same house you grew same, up in? Yes, it's That's been remodeled cool. many times. Of course. <laughs> Another thing of that generation, I think, is they can't sit still. They like to have projects and keep doing stuff. Mm. Growing up with my parents, their big thing was, um, or our big joke now, the way that I travel the world, that roughing it for the male family was traveling in an RV without plug-ins. Uh. So the fact that I can go sleep out in the woods overnight with, a mylar blanket just my parents don't know you where that came that from no mm. no we always looked at mountains but we didn't go up in them <laughs> other than where the motorhome could drive to uh -huh. so I feel like there was a lot of other things that I gained from my family life my parents had us busy in ballet horseback riding bowling girl scouts any kind of class course flying horseshoe ranch like all these different things that I got to do as oh, a kid Gave me this mentality of like, I can try it. I'll, I'm in. I'll, I'll give it a go. So it was a different kind of adventure, you know, that they were seeking. Yes. And you tried a little bit of everything, it sounds like. And your siblings, do you have brothers and sisters? I have a younger sister and probably same mentality. We took different channels with what we learned as kids. She's more career. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm not career focused, but hers is a more traditional career focused as an interior designer. Mm. She's gotten into soccer. She's beat her body up a little bit with some of the more contact sports had to have some knee surgeries and things like that mm. um yeah but she stayed more career focused she's back in the northwest as well so we've got our little small family unit uh, reconnected up there that's cool and so when you come back to california it's not really like reconnecting in that way you really feel like washington's your space definitely it's your blood. yeah we traveled a lot to california i grew up going to disneyland with family mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. that bit so California feels comfortable too and I I wonder when the seasonal affect 
disorder sets in up in Washington if maybe that California blood is coming through. Like, give me, give me the sun. <laughs> sunshine. Give me some sunshine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In these sports that you were playing when you're younger, were there some that really, you know, you became like, you know, very invested in them? Or did you just try a little bit of everything? Like you mentioned ballet, but then mm -hmm. other sports. Was there anything that really resonated and you kind of, it took hold? Oh, I've always been a runner. Always Through, running. Throughout all of that. I played soccer and volleyball and basketball, but there was always track and cross country, shouldering a lot of the sports mm. and running is a part of all of those sports. Mm -hmm. And I've always considered myself a runner and it wasn't until I found trail running that I felt like the energy went full circle. Mm -hmm. So I put a lot of energy into being a runner for, gosh, the first, I don't know. I started running track and cross country in seventh grade. Oh, okay. And then when I found the trails, my junior year of college, that's when it kind of made more sense. Like, why am I putting so much energy into this sport? That's when I found. Where did you go to why. college? University of Washington in okay. Seattle. Mm -hmm. Oh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. UW. <laughs> and then you found a running community there, or were you solo running for tranquility and, you know, mental health and so forth? I was a total team player. I mean, oh, as okay. much of a solo sport as running is, I try and make it a team sport. And maybe that's from of all those sports that I was involved in as a kid growing up. Mm -hmm. At the University of Washington, I walked on to the cross country and track teams. Nice. And running at University of Washington also meant running year round. So my body morphed into more of a runner at that point because you did cross country in the fall, indoor in the winter, and spring. In the spring, you ran track, so there was not that break to like put on a bunch of weight to be a basketball player or whatever it was mm -hmm. I was doing in the winter back at, um, in high school at Burlington. Mm -hmm. What were you studying? I, <laughs> a little bit I, of everything? A little bit of everything. <laughs> I think there's some trends here. I ended up getting a degree in romance linguistics. and a, Romance linguistics? Romance linguistics and a minor, in, a minor in Spanish. <laughs> That's it cool. was the degree I could get out of there in four years plus one quarter. I studied abroad in Ecuador. Oh, fun. So I guess to backtrack, I ran those sports the first three years of college, had a blast, loved being on the team, having an identity at the University of Washington where the numbers are just ridiculous. So there was something that I could connect into in a smaller scale of group of people. Mm -hmm. My junior year of college, I went overseas and studied in Ecuador for six months. Awesome. And being there, I actually went down there injured. I had some, I don't remember what it was, the injury that I went down there with. I didn't run for the first two months I was there. And one day I was living with my host family, decided that I was just going to go for a run. And they looked at me funny because I was just wearing a sports bra and a pair of shorts. <laughs> it was hot. It was keto Ecuador or up at altitude. Yeah. I didn't know the difference of altitude at that point. Mm -hmm. And I went out and I didn't come back for like two or three hours and just went exploring and they, they were, were all worried. worried. Yeah. Like, I mean, they're responsible for this yeah. American girl that's been living with them for two months. They know her a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I kept doing that. So I found this like longer distance running than I'd out ever. Solo in a wilderness uncharted for you. Yeah. A lot that's of roads. Cool. I didn't really understand trails and um, running in the mountains at that point. So mm -hmm. I would just run these long mountain pass type roads, big trucks. And I, it was kind of a. I guess some sort of exploratory, but not really knowing enough mm -hmm. to do it safely mm -hmm. kind of thing. But I'd always had a coach tell me how many minutes to run or how many repeats to do. Mm -hmm. And this was the first time I was going Unstructured. off on my own. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. And, you know, all the foreshadowing or whatever. When I came home from Ecuador, I went back to the running store that I'd been working at prior. And the shop had been bought by a new person and his name was Scott McCoubrey is M Scott McCoubrey he's still around and he had hired Scott Jurek who had just won his first western states as um, his first employee interesting and I went back in as a college kid like I need my job back I gotta pay for school my senior year and they hired me back and within I think it took about six months I wasn't willing to give up my Sunday morning sleep in <laughs> But about six months into it, Not they as a finally student, you needed it. Oh well, that was the only day you ever slept mm -hmm. in. I worked at a coffee shop on the on Saturdays and the running shop on Sundays, and then picked up different shifts during the week if I could with my school schedule. So Sunday morning, the running store didn't open till ten, so I actually got to sleep in. But the guys would get up and go run out at Cougar uh, Mountain. 
-hmm. six. I think they met at the store at six, running by seven, and then back to the store by 10. So Mm -hmm. I finally got suckered into one. I think we'd all been out on a running thing Saturday night. And they said, you got to come in the morning. And then I just never missed one after that. Oh, cool. And you were how old at this point? Two, Mm -hmm. 21, 22. I ran my first ultra March of 2000. So okay. my, March of my, is that my senior year? Yeah, I graduated in 2000, so March of 2000. So when you graduated, <clears throat> did you determine that running needed to be part of your career path, or did you have a whole other, um, you were studying the language of love, so where were you mm-hmm. going to go with that? Yeah, all, <laughs> all the languages of love. Mm-hmm. I had this intention of going overseas and teaching Spanish, because oh, cool. I really do love the language. But I gave myself a year to just work at the running store and see what happened in life. Like just you're Mm -hmm. done with school. That was what like my break year or whatever was just to work in the running store, run all these awesome races. Scott McCubrey just like tucked me under his wing and Mm. took me to all of the it was a lot of road running at the time. Actually, we did those. We had Rainier to Pacific, which is kind of like hood to coast Mm -hmm. or half marathons and. We just traveled a lot with the store and did some really cool events as teams. And my year was up September 1st for me. Like that was when I was going to start looking into this overseas lifestyle or whatever I was going to do. And I think about July, June or July, this guy named Ian Torrance. I'd been friends with him through the trail running community. You probably interviewed him too. (laughs) We're going to. He's great. They're race slow ambassadors also, him and Emily. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So Ian Torrance, um, through the running community, reached out. He was leaving the Montreal position that he was working in to go to the Forest Service. And he he took it upon himself to find somebody to fill that job. Oh. And we actually were working out. He was injured at the local gym together on the ellipticals. And he talked me through the whole position and got excited about it. Well, this is my time. I'm trying to figure out what's next. Yeah. And I put my name in the hat and went through the whole interview process. That must have been June because in July at White River, I was, I ran the race as my first 50 miler. I coordinated all the volunteers for Scott McCooper, who was the race director and helped corral the elite athletes that were coming to run the race. Nice. I ended up placing among the elite athletes (laughs) while also being the volunteer coordinator. (laughs) And the oh, Montreal awesome. president was there observing the whole thing. So I quickly made my way through the wow. interview process by mm-hmm. just showing it in real time. Just out of curiosity, how many females were there at this point in this space? You had to be one of the few. There, I believe, I want to say Ann Trayson was there that year. Luann yeah. Park, I remember running mm-hmm. with her. Petra Pierk and Ann Heaslett. <laughs> I think so that was fun. that year. There was a couple of those early years. Mm-hmm. running with all those women but I think that was that I think Anne Heaslett won it and Petra was second and maybe Luann was third or something like that so you didn't go overseas I did not go overseas I took this job with Montreal yeah. as the athlete coordinator and I think one or two months into the job I went to the president and said I need to go to these races because mm-hmm. I was my job was to coordinate the sponsorship of them which included water bottles and shoes and but from afar quirky little things yeah from Seattle and I said, I need to learn this sport. You hired me to, to yeah. get it. I love it. Mm-hmm. So he approved a budget, and I started traveling one or two months into the job. Wasatch Front 100 was the first race. I actually like bought a plane ticket, too, and mm-hmm. couldn't believe somebody else was paying for my travel to, <laughs> to go see these awesome mountains. And that this was a job, right? Like, I'm yeah. paid to do this. What? Yeah. Not very much, but I was paid right. to do it. <laughs> yeah. um, out of curiosity also, why were you drawn to Spanish as the language of choice? And if you were going to travel abroad, and do you still speak Spanish? If you don't use it, you lose it. So mm-hmm. I definitely don't have as great a vocabulary as I used okay. to, but it's still there. Two years ago, I got to travel to a lot of Spanish-speaking countries for the did racing. Did it come back? It did. It really yeah. did. It helped a lot to get to be in the environment. Submersion. I think I've gravitated towards it because it was growing up in Skagit Valley. There was a lot of migrant workers and I worked in the strawberry fields and oh, okay. I got to speak Spanish at the restaurant that I mm-hmm. worked at. There was just a lot of um, understanding of the language early on in life. So when it came time to study it, it came easy mm-hmm. and I love the sound of it. Like it just mm-hmm. resonates with me. 
And as I went on to learn the linguistic side of it, the earlier those introductions happen, those synapses yeah. form in our brain. So to anybody that ever wants their child to know second language, the earlier they can be introduced to it, whether they understand the grammar or how it all works, just hearing those sounds, they'll have it later in life. So I think I just had it because of where I grew up, the jobs I had, and then it came easy later. It develops a different part of your brain, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So we all really need that. Oh, and then really? I wonder yeah. how that different part of your brain serves you later in life. Like, are you seeing a more creative side? So you've authored books, you've been in films, there's other pieces of your life that are more creative oriented. Mm -hmm. I would say the whole career thing has been creative. <laughs> yeah, being yeah. self-employed and being an entrepreneur, yes. right? That's yeah, super creative. It has to be. And you're willing to take more risks. Yeah. I think living overseas in Ecuador, I've actually talked to some people that I've traveled with recently okay. about that experience of... Mm. Putting a living, footprint? Well, and living in a, another country with no identity. Because if you can't communicate, you can't well, not express. With no identity, you, but with like this clean slate. Like you could They could anything. look at it that way too. Yeah. I find that when I travel too. So it's so interesting that you're saying that because that's totally what just came up. Mm. Like you you can be anyone in that space. You're Each unknown mm -hmm. to this community. That part. And then, but you can't communicate whoever you want it to be. Mm. So being in that vulnerable position of wanting to communicate, wanting to joke, wanting to connect. make people laugh, connect, connect with people and not being able to because you have this language barrier. Oh, wow. That helped help open my mind. So now when I travel, I don't expect people to speak English. Like mm -hmm. I'm in their country. They, right. So you, cr you create ways to connect in other Menu without words. So like what? How do you connect if you're in a strange space? And you travel a lot now and you've traveled mm -hmm. quite a bit, I mean, extensively. What tools do you use to oh, connect I'm with totally, the locals? Uh, physical, physical get, <laughs> body vi language. Get visual, be comfortable getting close with people uh -huh. or demonstrating, Touching. showing things on drawing, mm -hmm. however creative you can get to to show that you're interested in learning about them. And you, it's not that you expect them to speak your language that you're trying to learn mm -hmm. or be involved because they oftentimes like there's like this whole learning thing that happens between both people mm -hmm. in that space in all the different countries you've been to and environments and it's not just running it's in all these other capacities i mean your conservation and all the other passions that you have what country or what tribe of people did you feel most at home with I would say the one that surprised me the yeah. most, uh, I felt the most home with was in Japan and is in Japan. Really? I, if I had like, if I looked at a map when I was starting this whole thing out, the places that I thought I would have gone, New Zealand, Australia being the top ones, I've never been there. I don't know that I would have picked Asian countries just mm -hmm. out of my life experience up to that point. Mm -hmm. And it is where I enjoy going the most. What I've about been it? Back to Japan three times now and to China twice. Philippines once, Thailand once. Wow. I, um, yeah, Asia and Southeast Asia. The um, Japan really speaks up. If I had to pick one, that's the one that calls out to me because of that desire to connect with with you. So the languages couldn't be more opposite. The characters, impossible everything. Impossible to learn. It's impossible. Like yeah. I'm not probably going to ever be able to say much more than arigato, or <laughs> but. People like will sit there and look at a map with me and help me figure out how to figure out the subway. Or mm. you obviously, I obviously stand out when I'm there. So if I'm looking at it, like struggling at all and show interest to connect with somebody, there was never a time that I felt like people just like walked by and eyes down. Oh. There's always somebody that wanted either to practice their English, whether it was their own selfish purpose, or just generally saw that need and wanted to wanted mm. to help and be a part. I'm also like a gift giver. I like to travel with little things like chocolate or whatever from home. People always joke that I bring chocolate to Switzerland. Like, Chrissy, really? Like, <laughs> chocolate over there. They have their own. But in Japan, that exchange, like, never stops. Like, if I gave them a, a chapstick, they would give me some chopsticks. Or if I gave, like, they can, huh. you can never just, like, thank you for hosting me. No, 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 we're glad you're here. Like, that, that gratitude just keeps going back and forth. So oh, for a lot of different cool. reasons, I guess the last one being the food. I love the Oh, you do? Japanese food. I race really well on noodles and rice. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Okay. There's a great picture from UTMF of me shoving noodles in my face <laughs> with chopsticks at one at of an the aid station. station. Oh, I love it. And they just loved that the whitey could use 
chopsticks. Mm -hmm. You actually have the skill set down. Mm -hmm. In growing up, extracurricular activities, then, was it primarily sports or were there other things? Like, did you have music? Did you have art? I would say primarily sports. Yeah. We had, I guess Girl Scouts would be Girl Scouts. a little different. Mom was the troop leader. She was? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mom was very involved. My dad traveled a lot for his work. He was an engineer, a marine engineer. So he would be gone mm -hmm. for three to six months at a time. And then he, we say, came home when I was 13 and worked on the ferry boats. Mm -hmm. So it was around more in my teenage marine years. Marine life still. Yes. Or yeah. water life. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you grew up with that experience too, mm -hmm. getting that exposure. Definitely. We celebrate the holidays on the ferry boat. We'd go down in the engine room. Dad would make the big turkey dinner and then the house would be clean. On the boat? Right home. Oh, yeah. My mom loved it. The oh, kitchen was always cool. clean on the holidays. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then she was a troop leader, you said, for Girl Scouts? Or? Oh, she did everything. She organized the school carnival. I mean, she was total PTA mom, soccer mom. She'd mm -hmm. stand on the sidelines and, you know, I would be back in the goal picking flowers and she'd be, Chrissy, get out your hands up. Mm -hmm. so. So what kind of values did that instill for you growing up, having that those be your parents? I feel like I've always been supported, no mm. matter what, I've never had far to fall. And so to take the leap eight years ago and say, you know, I'm I'm going to try this athlete lifestyle. Mm -hmm. To go professional. I, to go professional and see if I can financially support myself doing it. I had two rules I had to keep enjoying it because when your passion becomes the way you have an income, that gets a little can get a little scary. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't go into credit card debt. I wasn't going to do this at an expense like that. Mm. So the savings that I put aside is still there. I've never touched it eight years wow. later. Wow. And That's definitely amazing. built on it. I've been able to buy a condo and I own a dog now and <laughs> other things. Like I just really kept things slim for a long time until I could really figure it out. What did your parents think? How did that go when you had that conversation? Again, 100% supportive. Wow, cool. And the one that surprised me more probably was my dad in that instance. Um, he's, I think the thing that he's most proud of and he's expressed to me more in just the last couple of years is that I'm living it the way I, I want to. The support that he shows for is unconditional. That, that drive is more than unconditional. It's more almost like in a way that he wished he could have done it for himself and he's proud to see that his daughter could do it. Oh, kind of a, a... It sounded like he did it. kind of live life by his own terms, though. He oh, was, he definitely yeah. did. I mean, he, he his work was very hard, like mm -hmm. physically very hard. So I think... I mean, not to say that ultra running is not physically hard. It is. But <laughs> <laughs> it is. He, he definitely put in some hard time to be an engineer and work at sea and be away from his fam young oh, family. Oh, so he'd be out on a boat for months at a time? That's oh, what that travel looked like? Yeah, three to six, sometimes nine months, he'd be gone on, on work. In we didn't have seas? Yep. Oh, yeah, a lot wow. of... That was actually a cool like, tie-in. What's that? A kinship. kinship. Definitely. I, when I traveled to Thailand, I had like seven hours in Bangkok. And I went, like, threw my luggage in a locker and went and took the trains around and saw as much as I could. And there was these porcelain elephants that the entryways to some of the temples. Our telephone sat on a porcelain in your home? elephant in my home. <laughs> and I had this, like, <laughs> aha moment with my dad. Like, so cool. Dad, these, I didn't know where they came from, but he, that was one of the ports that he'd stopped at around the, wow. around the world. So. Anyways, those that that finding those connections later in life mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the travels that he had done. I um, love it. Yeah. So when you share your travel stories with him, like there's really something that resonates between the two of you there. Mm -hmm. Except mm -hmm. for the fact that he doesn't have a passport anymore. He doesn't want to have any desire to travel oh, he's at all. Done. So I wonder, am I pushing myself to that point that I'll be done with travel at some point? I hope mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Hopefully not. Mm -hmm. And if you do, then that's what that, you know, exactly. that next level of your life looks like as well, right? Yep. And then mom and Girl Scouts, what did you learn in Girl Scouts? I love <laughs> a Girl Scout that really has served you now as a grown woman in your life and in particular in this industry that, you know, you're in the endurance sport industry as a professional runner. Yeah, I have both the tie I would make with Girl Scouts. Yeah. I, I love the camaraderie. Team. I think that's the thing that always comes out for me is that interaction with other people and mm. working towards something. So all the badges we had to, you know, 
work together to learn how to make a campfire. Oh, you get a badge and the reward from it. Why Maybe. don't we get badges as adults? Yeah. <laughs> we need gold stars. Now. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like we could develop a whole badge system around um, <laughs> training camps and so forth. That might be kind of a cool thing to bring back. A retro <gasps> the, badge system. With the um, sashes that you get to sew them on and everything. Yeah. I never made it to the vest. Pooping in the woods is yeah. a badge. Pooping in the woods is a badge. <laughs> Maybe those are the skills I learned. My dad jokes. He taught me to pee in the woods and pee over the boat, and that's why I'm a good ultra runner. So ah, I'm that's to awesome. Do those things outside. <laughs> I don't know. So then, are you and your sister tight? She lives locally, or do you have separate, really separate lives because you've gone in different directions? We've, I would say, we've had very separate lives. She got married very young, mm -hmm. and um, went that path with the marriage. And I've bounced around and done my thing and moved all over the place. We did live pretty close together when I was in Boulder. We were about 40 minutes away, but we still only saw each other on the typical like family gathering holidays. Okay. She moved back to Washington three years ago, and that's been our reconnection. Unfortunately, she had, she's gone through a divorce, mm -hmm. and she had a life like flip on her a little bit. And mm. it's, you know, one door closes, another opens. And I would say that our relationship has grown a lot in that time through some hard stuff and then more recently really connecting on who we are as individuals. And mm, that's cool. I read a lot about how relationships work. And I think with siblings, they're often our opposite because it shows us more about ourselves and she's blonde hair, blue eyed. She oh, was a really? soccer player, mm -hmm. you know, and physically uh, brown hair, brown eyed. Our limbs are very different. Like the only place we look similar is right across the bridge of our nose is what people say. Mm. And to have that, it's not even a mirror. It's more just like the opposing polar opposite to show us who we are better. I think she and I have connected over that, like learning how we can each understand ourselves better because of how opposite our sibling is. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And you get along in that way. So it's not an opposition of we're so different. You know, we don't see eye to eye and there's conflict there. It's more of a respect for the individual differences. I would say we went through you the did first part to get to the second part. <laughs> there was a learning there? Yes, yeah. definitely. Oh, that's yeah. cool. And um, for yourself now, it's interesting. I mean, a lot of your professional life has involved public speaking, um, writing, mm -hmm. being in films and things like that. TEDx, I mean, you got an opportunity to speak on the TED stage. That was a huge opportunity, yes. Yeah. So that's another side of you as a professional woman in endurance sports. And how has that served you? What have you learned there? I guess I've always, with that mentality of I can try it or I'll do it or I'm in. I, I, on my website, I think it still says that I always approach the world as I'm in. I don't want to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And so when things come at me, like I wouldn't have ever picked to write a book. I didn't consider myself an It author. wasn't on your list. So you didn't no. pursue that. They pursued you. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you really grow up thinking I'm going to be an ultra runner? Not, at least not in my what era. What the hell was an ultra <laughs> runner, think, right? I think people now have more of an idea of yeah. what that could look like because there are examples of people making a living and a, almost seen as a viable career, if you mm -hmm. will. It, that was not Or women in endurance sports, really. period. Take it to one more step. Definitely. Yeah. That was, I had Michael Jordan's poster on my wall growing <laughs> up, I didn't have a lot of women or any women athletes that I even resonated in my mind that that's who I would look up to. Mm -hmm. A little side story about that. I was on book tour with Scott Jerk for the first week and we were in, I think it was Boston. And this girl was standing like two people back and just sparkle in her eyes, intense smile on her face and waiting to talk to me. And she eventually, I mean, it didn't take much longer for her to scoot forward she introduced herself and she said, I had to come meet you when I found out you were here because I was helping with the kiddos, the, the jerks, two little babies. And I, I kind of, I must have given her a quizzical look or whatever. And she said, I grew up listening to stories about you. Wow. So the, I think it was Brian Powell's book, Relentless Forward Motion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your short her, stories. Her in there. dad would read those stories to her. And I asked her, I said, what year were you born? <laughs> <laughs> and she said 1999, and that was the, when I started training in 2000. I ran my first ultra. So here, this girl, I get to be that like female role athlete model. role model, where I never even had somebody like that. It's mm -hmm. such a cool 
you wouldn't, I wouldn't ever have expected or even had that as a goal in mind for myself. And to have a moment like that with this girl, Ella was full circle, full and super special. Like mm -hmm. I just, I gave her a big hug and I took pictures with her and it was, it felt more for me. She was having this moment of getting to meet her role model. And I was having like the full circle energy mm -hmm. with her of like, wow, you've like the, if there's anything I've ever been doing this for is to meet someone that's exactly. benefiting from like that. Yeah. And it's just really happening at a whole other level now, right? So it can happen, yeah. we're both professional women in the industry and we belong to a group we founded together, yes. which is we cred the women's um, coalition, no collaboration because <laughs> we played with this a lot too, which is kind of funny. Um, collaboration of race directors and event directors. So professionally now being a woman in the industry is really changing and evolving. It's a really exciting time. So we, we connect in that way too. And you being a race director, what's happening with your world now professionally and where do you see women in this industry going? Like, how do you see the future of it? I, f I feel like it spans out across more than just ultra running in terms of how women's, mm-hmm. There, oh, there's something on the news this morning that's ringing a bell, but how the the gap is lessening in terms of why does it have to be women or men? Like we are humans and we're yes, all together. able and capable and just, no, <laughs> I was going to say, you know, <laughs> I would cut this out um, just because we have ovaries doesn't mean we can't run. Like yeah. all these things or that estrogen. have been proven that like, it's just a different approach. Like you made the comment earlier that that's a, more feminine way to coach perhaps the way ah. I, I connect with my athletes. Yeah. It doesn't make it right or wrong. No. It's like some people need that. I have equal number of men and women clients. It's not that I gravitate more towards women mm -hmm. or men, but the people that I work with as humans, my approach works for them. So I, I feel like that whole, like the, the separation is changing and how we view it. What then comes from it, I think there's a lot of conflict because of the history of how it has been separated. So how do we now deal under these new guidelines or these new ways that we understand mm -hmm. that it doesn't have to be so different just because of our gender or color of skin? Like there's all those those things that are are becoming more forefront now. I, I don't I don't see it as like trying to say a separation. Or something that we need to stand on a mountaintop. So some of the things we've talked about in our group that we regularly meet and talk about the industry and ourselves as professionals in it. <clears throat> Challenges, best practices, but how we can support each other in succeeding in this in this way is really that the I think we both feel strongly about the fact that there is no reason to stand up and be like, we're women doing this and we need mm -hmm. to be treated different or otherwise. We really don't, actually, and we're just as equal and competent and capable, but really wanting to have that um, trickle down effect on other women in the industry and girls mm -hmm. in the sport, endurance sports as a whole, and just having a place at the table. Mm -hmm. the but positive. it's not because we're women, it's just because we're professionals exactly. and we deserve that space. And the positive impact, the influence of just how we choose to go through it, how that could influence whoever wants to listen, not just girls and women. Absolutely. Like whoever like resonates with or mm -hmm. knowing that there's different points of view. The challenging part for myself, and this is again, probably a lot or maybe too much reading on, <laughs> on issues like that is, and resonating with the, I guess, is stereotypes the right word where because of that, like maybe softer side or humble side that comes with the way I was raised as a female speaking up for like my, my value mm. or, I don't just have to like give this away. It's mm -hmm. um, self-worth. The, the, well, the lean in mentality of like how a man and a woman are viewed and following, falling into that category where the essay, there was an essay that was written. And if you, ch he, they changed the pronouns and name from Michael and him to Heather and her. Mm. And he was viewed as a leader. She was viewed as a bitch. Oh, fascinating. Same essay. And when same I, delivery of information, same delivery of information, it was just the pronouns and the name. And I, 
I'm, I was fascinated by it because I've, I read it the same way and I, I saw why he was seen as a leader and she was seen as a bitch. And I, I've fallen to that, I guess, mm. at times where I'll, I'll not speak up or I won't ask for the same thing. And it's not because I don't want to, it's, I don't know how, like I wasn't okay. raised that way. So I, I would say that's the biggest challenge in mm -hmm. that and why it feels maybe more separated is because of these like ingrained ways of approaching it. I wasn't raised with that. Yeah. So we're sense. fine. We're still finding our voice in this space professionally and otherwise a lot of us yeah. are it's, it feels like more That's of a challenge men too me. yeah it right it's like more of a challenge to me mm -hmm. than it sh than it necessarily should because if i look at my resume or just this week traveling for this film and having different people introduce me that's a fascinating moment how they me. introduce you every time is it a little different it's a little different but with the accolades that they rattle off uh -huh. if i heard that for anybody else man female i would be like holy cow <laughs> that that's incredible this woman's been running for 18 years. She's yeah. still winning 100-mile races on the international stage. Yeah. But for me to say that about myself, mm. that's always been a harder like, what, pill to swallow, whatever analogy you want to use for that. I, mm -hmm. I haven't been able to own that where I know plenty of people that can stand there and just and own it like that. And I mm -hmm. wish... For anybody that's growing up now, just like own it as you go. Don't have to fight for it later. Like you, you've done the hard work. You've put yourself out there. You've won. You've lost. Whatever. Like just own the whole story. Don't feel so. I don't have to con control it or humble it or dumb it down. Mm -hmm. I guess that would probably be. I feel like a lot of times I have to dumb it down so that people don't put me up on some pedestal or something. I love the terminology. Um, being comfortable in your own skin. Mm -hmm. And like there's aspects of that physically and then being an athlete and then being a professional woman and then being a speaker and then all the other aspects of who you are and then really who we are all as individuals, male, female, otherwise, you know, mm -hmm. and how we all eventually, hopefully, um, over our lifetime do get comfortable in our own skin and mm -hmm. sometimes it happens age earlier and that. sometimes yeah. it happens later exactly <laughs> yeah so you're still young but aging I like turned that 40 this year I'm so Woo! psyched so it's like everybody says that ah, you stop caring about all that stuff and you yeah. <laughs> just own your own your story I think I'm in that yeah. process so you feel that that is happening more and more as you've mm -hmm. passed 40 okay yeah and well and dumbing it down doesn't service anybody never it never, never. helps somebody it doesn't serve the world no mm -hmm. not at all why would you put any kind of shadow over yeah any kind of accomplishment because if I shadow mine then that shadows somebody else's that it doesn't exactly. make sense now I've done it for way too many years but it doesn't mm -hmm. make sense now do you, well, you coach, so you actively mentor people right now. And we were talking about your coaching style. It, it is not just, um, you know, the physiology and the training cycles and all this mm. stuff. You're coaching the full human, the all in human. What does that look Probably like Probably more you? the full human than the physiology side. Okay. Yeah, definitely incorporating people's, the reality of life into their training. Training is a part of what they do. It isn't what they do. And I don't give them a schedule for four weeks and say, see ya. Mm -hmm. And checking in with them weekly, as long as my travel allows, um, checking in with them weekly to make sure that what I assigned last week still moving forward, how do we build on what they ended up doing? Not just what I scheduled, what to actually happen for them. Did they miss a night's sleep because they had a kid that was sick? That doesn't help with a long run. So helping adjust for their the reality of their life so that their training can fit in. Mm -hmm. That was actually the hardest part about writing a book because it was a solid plan and I couldn't morph it for people week over week. Yeah. So it built in some flexibility and I've had great compliments from people telling me that they really appreciated as much flexibility that they could get in there um, as much as a book can allow. Mm -hmm. but I, I feel like if you need that, a coach is a really good sounding board to to talk about how life fits in with training and not just, I would look for that in a coach, not just a training plan. Cause it is hard to follow just a training plan. Oh, absolutely. It, it uh, collaborates with your life. It's much, and becomes a part of your life. It's much more doable. Well, you know, I've been a coach too. And we were just talking about, I'm interested in maybe coaching again now mm -hmm. that I took yeah. a really significant break from it. And it's the human connection piece. I miss the most, I bet. interestingly enough. Yeah. 
Um, but there are so many different training plans. It's nuts. I just met with an athlete on Friday and looked at his training plan and I was like, there's, it's just so opposite of what I would have designed for that human because it wasn't personalized at all. Mm -hmm. But what did you learn writing a book about yourself? What was that process like? And what'd you learn about Chrissy? I think I reinforced that I'm very much an extrovert. Ah. (laughs) Writing is so introverted and you... And for myself to write, I, it has to be quiet. I have to be alone. It, it's a very like solo process. And Introspective. Yes. Mm. And I, I get a lot of that when I'm moving and running and the yeah. stillness of writing and being in a space with all of those thoughts without getting to move through them, mm. like physically move through them. That was a, I would say it was probably the most challenging piece of writing and The second piece would be the muse, like getting the inspiration to get the words to flow. I'd fortunately been taking some writing classes because I do have interest in writing a book of more stories of this crazy life that I've lived. And that's been backburnered due to life in a lot of ways. But the training manual came up amidst this whole writing process. So I feel really thankful of the timing that I'd already been working on how to tune into my muse or Mm. set aside time to write every day, not just wait for the muse to come, but actually like sit there and make yourself even just type garble, garble (laughs) words so that you get that flowing. I had some of those steps already in place, but I think. How do you describe your muse? What or who is it? What does it look like? He, she, it. I think it depends on the the project for this one, for that book. It was my coaching clients. I would, I really drew on the inspiration that I had from coaching for five years up to that point. And, and that's why it's titled running your first ultra, which I learned later actually pigeonholed myself Mm -hmm. because I have friends that read it because they're my friends and they, people would tell me like, Chrissy, I've run 50 ultras. And this still taught me a lot about my own training or other friends that wanted to hear the little stories that I have in there. And they said, I'll never run an ultra. But I, I learned something from this book and will be able to add it to my life and whatever passion that I have. Oh, so great. the title really focused on the coaching client that I love to work with. But it actually spans a broader audience. If I could retitle it, I don't know what I would retitle it. But mm-hmm. <laughs> it um, that was who who I wrote to was my, my early coaching clients, those first timers, people that are curious and maybe even think it's impossible, but they're curious enough to try. Mm-hmm. And then the, one, the ones that give me a call and say that they did it later. Mm-hmm. Those are my favorite stories is when they, they get to share the, I've gone through the hard bits with them, whether it's learning how to eat better, how to run uphill faster or be more efficient in their training or working with their time and then have the event or the race that they've been working towards go well because they went through all of the hard and low the lows and highs leading up to that point and I got to share and all of that with them well coaching so far for you and all the individuals that you've coached what has been one of your proudest moments and it can be you as a coach or something really connected to an athlete in a different way as Mm -hmm. a human maybe not even their athletic endeavor I would say the the most rewarding is when clients keep like keep interacting whether that I'm coaching them or not mm-hmm. because they there's something that like they connect with my goal with coaching clients is that they learn it enough for themselves so I might take someone through their first 50k then their first 50 mile and then their first 100 mile and then they've got enough skill set that they'll they'll Continue. go and do it on their own mm-hmm. but it's actually really rewarding when they keep coming back So I hope that I'm giving them the tools they need to do it how they need to do it. Mm -hmm. I love that like continued relationship. And maybe it's the hugest compliment is that they keep coming back and that we get to keep working together. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if those oppose each other, but Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the, the continual relationship with, with all of them is. So your coaching style is relationship based. You're, you're in, a little bit deeper, not even a little bit, a lot deeper, like the next level is building that relationship with the individual so you can adapt their program, but then ultimately so you can have a relationship Mm -hmm. that has longevity. I think that's that's how I approach life, I think. So it it, it definitely shows up in my my coaching world when I get on the phone with people. I'm Mm -hmm. 
How about race directing? As much as I can. Mm -hmm. As you're a race director, you know that day. And that's probably the hardest thing, traveling as much as I do and re-meeting the people. Oh, I ran Chuck and Nut in 2012. Or mm -hmm. I talked to you at the Chuck and Nut finish line and my eyes just glaze over. And that race day is... How long have you had that so, race? 16 years now. Wow. Mm -hmm. I started when I was 24. I... Yeah, I wish that I could lock in all of those names and those encounters. And oftentimes if they'll tell me a, a bit of a story, like if they can tell me a little bit about that meeting or, you know, I didn't get my finisher's prize. So I came up and bugged you like three different times. I'll be like, oh, yeah, no, I remember you. But the um, that's probably the hardest thing with race day, race directing is I'm, I'm in mode that day to, mm -hmm. to pull off an event for a lot of people and. I always say, if you meet me on Chuck on at race day, please reintroduce yourself <laughs> at another point. Mm -hmm. Will you continue race directing that race and or others? Is that something that you like to do more of? Or you find that balancing everything else that you're doing, that, that one event a year is plenty? The latter. I'm really happy with putting my all into one event. Mm -hmm. I feel like for me to be able to do multiple, it'd have to be more turnkey. Mm -hmm. And this way I get it to be just unique to that one event mm -hmm. so and i i've thought about it at different points moving yeah, I'm around sure you get other opportunities as well oh definitely and there's yeah. great places all over the world that you're like oh this would be an awesome spot for a race mm -hmm. but i feel for me it's good to just keep connected to, it was my first ultra i get to was it oh yeah and oh, that was wow. the one i ran in 2000 and then the race directors decided they were done in 2002 that was 10 years for them mm. and then 2003 i took it over and it's your baby then Definitely. Yeah, I yeah. have friends that have kids that are about the same age as <laughs> the race that I direct. I love that. I love that. And the biggest compliment with that is that the race founding race director still marks the course for me every year, 16 years later. He's gone through his career, retirement, the whole bit. And Doug McKeever still meets me every year and takes my pin flags and <laughs> creates signs and marks the ridge with all this his third grade humor. And this says a lot about the race and it also says a lot about you as a race director and how you manage that team and mm -hmm. that event and how it really is a family you've created, you've co-created because mm -hmm. you took it over. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Yeah, the relationship part of it. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of different co-race directors throughout okay. the years and I, I, I've looked into like why is that and I feel like it's such my baby that mm -hmm. my delegation, that's definitely something that I have to work on in terms of how I, I delegate. But it's also like, I will always have that first time running passion with it. And mm -hmm. Has the course changed? It has had to change just okay. a little bit here and there. Uh, we've moved back and forth along the inner urban, if you will. And then that's dictated how many more miles we can get up on the chuck and nuts. Mm -hmm. But we're kind of back to not the original course, but the classic course, the one that's it's run the most years, starting and finishing in Fairhaven Park. I have to get to that right now. Please point. come. <laughs> <laughs> I love having... I don't know if I want to run it or work next to you and see what that experience is like. Either yeah. one would be awesome. You'd be welcome for either or both. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm really interested in um, getting to understand a little bit more about what your value system is. And one of the things I see that I think is a little bit unique is that you have very strong values because I've gotten to know you as a human being and I have a lot of respect for you. you. But I see this interesting connection between you and your personal values and your personal brand and the brands that you align yourself with. And you've had a lot of sponsors for many, many years. So I was wondering if you could speak to those brand alignments and in particular those value alignments. I think the value alignments that keep coming up for me are longevity and relationship and connection. Mm -hmm. And one of the maybe challenging things in working with brands is there is turnover there. And so your relationships with the actual people end up changing. And But the brands that stay true to what their core mission is, the people that they hire all stay within that same mission. And I've been able to stay aligned with brands like Patagonia and Basque Footwear for over a decade because of the type of relationships that I maintain with the brand and the people that come and go through throughout those years. What are the core values there that really resonate with you? I feel like with Patagonia, the main one is that I get to keep learning. So that's, I guess, I don't know if that's a value or if it's just a 
motivator in how I work in life. I love to keep learning and Patagonia challenges me on many fronts Mm -hmm. and has led me into a lot of this conservation type work through saying you're going on this project to Patagonia (laughs) to encouraging me to speak about a film that I wasn't even a part of. I reading their blog and being like infiltrated with the messages that they've got. I feel like I've tied my own values in terms of doing the little bit that I can with what I have always trying to, to do the best I can with what I have. I guess that would be a value that I have Mm -hmm. and then applying that to things like conservation or race directing or my coaching clients, like always giving the best that I can to whatever it is that I'm working on. Mm-hmm. Really answering the question though. Mm-hmm. Well, you and your core values. So, I mean, I know you value conservation, you know, and human connection and travel and a, kind of a hunger for learning and adventure. Mm-hmm. Those are some of your core values. Is there anything in particular that really like rises to the top that maybe people wouldn't know about? I would say they probably know, but I love connection. <laughs> <laughs> Any of the big events that I've done, criticized or not for my team effort, I think with long distance running, there's this whole envisionment that it's so solo and you have to go alone mm. to, to achieve the bigger goal. And I don't believe that. I feel it. life is better shared and the experiences are better shared. Tahoe Rim was a really good example of that. I received some strong criticism for like having a team and having somebody run with me the entire time. And, oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Um I also received, people thought that was a negative. <laughs> Some people <laughs> thought it was fantastic. A, a, a lot of people really resonated with the story of these 12 people that got, yeah. that worked together to create this bigger One thing. It, we did it. Mm-hmm. I ran all the steps. So it's the FKT is Chrissy's time that went around the lake, but that time wouldn't have happened without those 12 people that absolutely joined me and picked out what clothing I was wearing, what food I would eat and, I think that's all part of the experience going through the lows and highs together. They all were there when I was really buggered up at the bottom of Rose mountain or coming off of Rose mountain and got me re rallied to go the final 60 miles. I had to find it somewhere in me to, to do put, the work. put one step and foot in front of the other. It's a heck of a lot more enjoyable when there's people there that want to give you their energy to it too. So Absolutely. that core value of connection and sharing experience plays out for better or worse in, in how I approach all of my experiences, I guess, not just running. Mm-hmm. Um, also coaching, race directing, writing, and public speaking. Do you carry those same core values with you or do other ones surface when you have those other roles in your life? I, all of the experiences except for writing. Writing is mm-hmm. the one that probably goes the complete opposite and having to be very solo. I had mm-hmm. that one's not one that I've been able to figure out how to share. Mm-hmm. Maybe I don't necessarily need to or want to, mm-hmm. but that one would be different than the others in terms of how I play that core value out. Mm-hmm. Um, one fun thing I notice on your Instagram is a lot. Your dog is featured. What's your dog's name? Oh, yay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Chance to talk about the PD pup. Yeah. Her name's Petey. Uh-huh. The initials PD. What kind of dog is Petey? Petey is a mini Australian shepherd. She gets mistaken for a border collie a lot. So I imagine that there's a little bit of that in her as well. She looks like a supermodel. I mean, honestly, oh. <laughs> it's funny because at first I was like, is that really her dog? Or is this like a model dog that is being, you know, traveling with you or something like that? Because the dog shots are so phenomenal. She's so Seriously. Cute. She's got so much personality. How long have you had her? I got her December of 2016. And how much running do you do together? We run to, as long as I'm not traveling, um, almost daily. Okay. And she runs anywhere from five to 10 miles at a time. Wow. She'll run five or six days a week. Mm-hmm. And maybe once or twice a month, she'll do a long run with me, which is 15 to 20 miles. The furthest she's ever gone is 22 miles. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wow. But so like once or twice a month, we'll mm-hmm. do that. And she's, she's great for it. She is a much better, ha- much happier dog. And I think there's a lot of parallels between her and I in terms of our, like, herding. Like, we like to bring people together, <laughs> <laughs> run to the yeah. front and back of the pack, make sure everybody's together. Um, kind of kooky craziness and love of running. And she loves to get in the water whenever we're out. And I just see her, like, pure enjoyment, like, dipping her nose under Mm-hmm. She's also got a very heavy coat, so it might just be needing to cool off. Who knows? 
Um, and then so much more calm and relaxed and comfortable in the world after a run. Mm. I always feel much better if I get some miles in and the fact that I have her leaning against the door being like intensely staring me down. She doesn't bark in that moment, but just intensely staring me down like, Mom, it's it's time. Waiting patiently. We got to go. Mm-hmm. Her name stands for Piedra Dura, which is a Spanish name. Oh. Back to my Spanish roots. And it stands for hard rock. Piedra is stone or rock, and Dora is hard. So hard rock, the race that was a pretty iconic moment for me in my ultra running career. But the name actually came from running down Fragrance Lake Trail, which is on the Chuckin' at 50K course. And I had this vision of getting a dog, and I wanted to do it before the end of the year. I said I got her December 15th. Um, I'd wanted a dog for 10 years, and if I didn't get her a dog by Christmas... I was going to call this whole want off like 10 years. is really? enough. Yeah. 10 years is enough to think about something. If I'm not going to do it, then it's time to like shut or get off the pot, I guess mm-hmm. is the statement. Like mm-hmm. it was time to just make the decision. Like I'm getting a dog or not. And I knew it was going to be a little girl. I knew it would be a herding type dog. And I was bouncing over these rocks coming down fragrance Lake trail. And like the name just Piedra hit me. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to be, hollering for Piedra, like if she took <laughs> off or whatever. Fortunately, she's a Velcro dog and she rarely takes off. Um, so I took the first two consonants and thought, well, PD is cute. Anything I'd read about naming a dog, it's good to have a long vowel at the end of the name because it resonates for the dog in terms of how they hear it, hear it and like okay. own it. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I had her for a couple of weeks and my dad got to meet her. He mm-hmm. also speaks Spanish. He came up with Dura for her oh, middle name. So that's how the name nice. evolved. Where'd you get her? That's a little bit of a touchy story. It came through family. Okay. And it was a it was a hard it was an easy like find like when I got her and met her and everything, the woman that I got her from ended up um, wanting her back. Oh. And so the first month of having PD was really hard because I didn't know if I was gonna get to keep her. But we went through a lot of talks and emails and understanding of why this dog was better with me and the commitment that I'd made to her and and you'd already fallen in love well and that's the whole part you're supposed to be bonding that first month Absolutely. and if I didn't know if I got to keep her or not that was a it was yeah so she, she worked her way right in my heart now. no matter what but yeah. oh she's <laughs> the best I'm gonna take her on her, her first road trip this summer she'll be at summer OR with me so we'll see how that wow. goes yeah where are you gonna go on your road trip what's it gonna look like we're heading, it's all kind of governed by commitments. I'll be at the summer outdoor retailer show. And then I have a couple of days in between to go spend some time in Boulder where I lived for three and a half years. And then Jeff Browning and I are putting on a running camp in Durango. Oh, cool. And then we're also putting on a running camp, uh, running around Mount Hood. So those two weekends back to back, we'll, we'll travel from Durango and then up to Mount Hood. Okay. On the circumnav of the Timberline Trail. Mm. And then maybe, maybe I can get you out to Moab, Utah. Somewhere in between. At some point, yes. Yeah. I would love to get out to Moab again. Mm-hmm. So I have a final question for you. As a race director, and if you could build any race, like time was not an issue, finance, resources, the success of the race, no, no other obligations externally, and you were going to create any kind of race, what would it be? Something different and unique that maybe is kind of funky or fun that you just would sort of dream up in a crazy way? I really like the multi-day Do you? type events. Okay. And like what? Whether it's a race or not. Trans Rockies was a really fun experience. Uh, running around Kilimanjaro, it wasn't a race at all, but we spent eight days stage running camping. around, camping, mm-hmm. the sag wagon piece of it, meal preparation, working together um, through setting up camp, tearing down camp, going for a run, figuring out how to bathe, like all those yeah. pieces I think are a lot of fun. So um, getting more than just a race, mm-hmm. but putting things an experience. To experience, putting people together, creating an environment. I, I think that's why I love coaching these camps is there's, we're going out and running and then we come back and we have time to interact. You get to share stories about what happened on the run, learn a little bit, mm-hmm. eat good food, mm-hmm. boil it down to the basics. 
running, eating, and sleeping. If that really could be my <laughs> career, I would, but that's not a reality. Exactly. And you also know with the multi-day stuff how um, you really do change over those days, not only mm -hmm. together, you know, as a group and who you're sharing that experience with, mm -hmm. but you as a person, because every day you just strip away like another layer mm. being out in the wilderness oh that's my favorite thing about running it's the easiest way to connect with someone mm. you're not wearing some costume you don't have your like appearance that you have to uphold you're all right wearing shorts and a t-shirt and maybe a hydration pack and mm. yours isn't any better or different than mine and we can just go for a run mm. doesn't matter what you bring up to that point if you're a race director or a lawyer or a garbage man or a nurse or whatever we're all runners in that instance and it strips away so much you get to learn people so much faster it's a great and, equalizer yes rather than sitting across the table if any first date could be on a run i would be that's like the way you should do it <laughs> <laughs> and so in closing is there any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience about what you've got coming up next or just some words of wisdom to keep people inspired is there maybe just discovering running, ultra running, or any kind of endurance sport for that matter, um, or just the world and life? Oh, man, that's a big question. It is. It can be re I always answer it very simply. I'm thankful for the lesson that my mom taught me at my very first ultra was to smile. Because to smile? This is so, the Girl Scout. It's so basic. But she, it was more out of fear and a little bit because she told me that if I looked like exhausted or tired or peakish or whatever, she pale, she would pull me from the event. Really? So I came into every aid station, like, full <laughs> smile. Hi, Mom! It didn't matter where I was at or what was hurting or how hungry I was. I just, oh. hi, Mom! And then the next year I was injured and I couldn't run the race. But I was there supporting a friend of mine. And I bounced around all the aid stations to crew him. And everybody at the aid stations, you were that girl last light last year. You were smiling the entire time. And it just like resonated with me. Like what a wonderful way to be remembered. remembered. Yeah. And so, and then also like there was some tough times in there and then to have to smile, to, to get to keep going and choosing that. Yeah. It's helped me in other events as well. So if it's feeling kind of gross or whatever, you're usually your whole body language changes at that point. Your shoulders crouch down, your head looks down, you're only looking two feet in front of you. And there's something about a smile that reverses all of that. Your head pops up, your chest opens up, you breathe a little bit easier. And, oh, maybe it's not so hard or yeah. so bad. So that actually translates to life, too. Oh, totally. <laughs> and how other people reflect that energy that you put out so whether you're arriving at an aid station and all these people are there right you know we're race Definitely. directors and we've worked at a lot of races and we've um, been at you yes. know races in a lot of capacity and isn't it funny the energy exchange that happens out there with others you yeah. come across in the course or whatever and if somebody's really in a funk how kind of you know it, it sort of soaks up mm -hmm. into your space a little bit and yeah. it's hard to deal with that sometimes whereas if they're totally rock solid like energy even though they might just be falling apart at the seams mm -hmm. like that feeds you too definitely mm -hmm. and i wrote about that in my book a little bit like you also have to own where you're at like own your story mm -hmm. but if you can find some humor around it so like if you end up puking on somebody's feet like make a joke about <laughs> it or whatever like man this sucks to be right here right now but i'm sure glad you guys are here with me or whatever yeah. whatever you can do to like shift that energy mm -hmm. a little bit I'm still working on applying that to life. I always, we always have to, our lessons to learn. Every day. Mm -hmm. Well, that means that you're still putting yourself out there and open to new experiences, right? Oh, there's always something to learn. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're not building character, you're dying. So I'd rather be on the other side of that. So. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks again for your time. It's oh, always great to see you. Yeah. I'm we'll glad I got to come to... through slow again. I'll see you in a couple months. I know. We'll see you at the slow ultra. Yes. Thanks. Baby. And the summit. U.S. Trail Running Conference. Thank you. Is that what we're calling it? <laughs> <laughs> U.S. Trail Running Conference. Got it. Got my words around it. We'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> A huge thank you to Chrissy for carving out so much of her time to sit down with Sam and I. You can follow Chrissy on Facebook and Instagram at Chrissy Mail. That's K-R-I-S-S-Y 
M-O-E-H-L. You can also find her at chrissymail.com. And thank you for joining us on this adventure to Endurance Town, USA, where we chat with people of all levels living the endurance lifestyle. Thanks again to our partners at Race Roster for making this Faces Behind the Races miniseries possible. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe button on your device now to hear more of our podcast as it lands and follow us on Instagram at Endurance Town USA for fun videos, behind the scenes photos, and all kinds of cool stuff. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time. We go on this journey to Endurance Town USA. USA. Bring it back.